Just a few days ago, a Mexican tuna boat rescued an Australian man after his damaged catamaran had been lost in the Pacific Ocean for three months. But that's not the story we're telling today. We're telling the story of one man who was lost for 438 days in that same ocean and made it out alive on the other side of the world. I'm Andrew Colon, and this is our latest story on the Mysteries of Latin America podcast. In 2012, two men left the Pacific coast of Mexico in a small fishing boat, hoping to have a successful catch and bring home some much needed money. Only one made it back to the shore alive. But that shore was in the Marshall Islands, over 5,000 miles away, and he was on that boat for 438 days. Welcome to the Mysteries of Latin America podcast. Hello, friends, and thanks for checking out the Mysteries of Latin America podcast. My name's Andrew Colon, and I'd like to thank you for tuning in on Spotify, iTunes, iHeartRadio, YouTube, and all the other places you can catch the Mysteries of Latin America podcast. Throughout history, stories of survival against all odds have captivated the human imagination. One such extraordinary story is that of José Salvador Alvarenga, a Salvadoran fisherman who embarked on a fishing trip that turned into a harrowing battle for survival on the high seas. Today, I'll dive deep, pun intended, into the life of Señor Alvarenga, chronicling his remarkable journey, the challenges he faced, and the enduring spirit that allowed him to defy the odds and emerge triumphant. And emerge, he literally did. From an innocuous initial voyage to a devastating storm, the relentless struggle for sustenance, the tragic loss of his companion, to the final triumphant moments of his rescue, we'll explore every facet of Jose's incredible odyssey. Jose Salvador Alvarenga was born in Garita Palmera, a small seaside fishing village in El Salvador, not far from the capital of San Salvador. Growing up in a humble fishing community, he was introduced to the Pacific Ocean at a very young age. His father, Jose Ricardo, who still owns a flour mill in Garita Palmera today, was also a skilled fisherman, and he taught a young Jose invaluable knowledge and techniques that would become crucial to his survival later in life. As a teenager, Jose began working as a fisherman, navigating the waters off the Salvadoran coast, where he honed his seafaring skills and developed an intimate understanding of the ocean's rhythms and moods. In 2002 and at the age of 27, Jose left El Salvador and made the 622 kilometer or 390 mile trip to the coasts of Chiapas, Mexico, where he put his advanced skills to the test and worked as a fisherman. Jose had no idea how those skills would be put to the ultimate test later on. On the morning of November 17, 2012, he got ready like he did every day he was going out fishing and went out with his usual partner, Ray Perez, to fish the deep seas of the Pacific Ocean nearby. Jose and Ray had worked together a long time, knew how to work together seamlessly to come back with a great haul of fish for their employer. That day they fished for six hours, caught plenty of fish, and came back to port at Costa Azul in the Mexican state of Chiapas. When they docked, Ray left to take care of some urgent paperwork, but Jose needed to get back out again as soon as possible. Since Jose was eager to go back out and Ray was taking too long, Jose offered a young man nearby the equivalent of $50 to go out with him to help. That young, inexperienced fisherman's name was Ezequiel Cordova. But before leaving, the boat's owner warned the two that there was a storm approaching that might give them some trouble. Jose brushed that warning off, and soon he and Ezequiel were off into the Pacific. The plan was to spend about 30 hours on the water, a long time, where they'd fish for sharks, marlin, and sailfish in the open ocean. Their vessel of choice was a modest little boat, a 7-meter or 23-foot 
topless fiberglass skiff that had one outboard motor and a refrigerator-sized icebox for storing fish and bait. With hope in their hearts and dreams of a bountiful catch, the two men set off in their modest fishing boat, equipped with their trusty fishing gear and supplies for their time at sea. Little did they know that their innocent fishing journey would soon turn into an unimaginable fight for survival. The fishing was excellent during their time out there, and they were able to fill the icebox with shark, mahi-mahi, and tuna. Excellent results for such a rudimentary operation. And then, out of nowhere it seemed, the storm hit. The seas churned and the spray and waves smashed against the boat and the men, and the boat was soon filling with water. Jose tried frantically to steer the boat toward shore while Ezequiel bailed water back out into the Pacific. But maneuvering a boat with over 1,100 pounds, 500 kilos of fish, along with their gear and other equipment, was next to impossible under these conditions. There was no way Jose could move the boat toward shore. So he made a decision that surely broke his heart. He threw the entire catch into the sea to lighten the vessel. But it didn't matter. The storm was just too overwhelming. It had blown them way off course. When the sun went down that first night, taking its heat with it, Jose and Ezequiel felt the cool night air hitting their soaking wet bodies and their only refuge against the cold was to flip the icebox upside down and huddle inside it for some kind of warmth. But water was filling the boat again, and so they switched off going outside to bail water and keep the boat from sinking along with them. Now to give you an idea, this wasn't a little squall that can pass after an hour or two. It was a massive storm. Remember the perfect storm? That lasted a total of five days. Once the storm had passed, Jose knew that they were well beyond being able to get back to Costa Azul. By his estimates, they were now at least 400 kilometers, or about 250 miles, away from their starting point. But the storm didn't just blow them away from their intended course. It killed their motor and many of the portable electronic support, including their GPS. In a fit of rage, Jose then smashed the motor with a club meant for fish. Their two-way radio was still working though, so Jose was able to reach his boss and ask for help before the radio's battery died. And so there they were in the open Pacific Ocean. No motor, lights, oars, not even an anchor anymore. And no way to make contact with anyone on dry land or at sea. The storm also took out or damaged a lot of their fishing gear and all they were left with were some very basic supplies and just a little food and water. But Jose's boss did get their emergency call, and he sent out a search party. But the search party didn't find any trace of the boat or men, and they gave up after searching for two days because visibility was poor and because they figured both men were lost for good. They had no clue they'd been blown so far away, and they left them for dead. For Jose and Ezequiel, it became painfully clear that they were out there in the deep waters of the Pacific, alone, lost, and drifting in the vastness of the ocean, and at the mercy of the currents and their own luck. Hours turned into days, and days into weeks. As they'd lost their anchor, Jose had the idea to string about 50 boys, still on the boat, to make a sort of sea anchor. It could give the boat some drag and maybe a little stability, at least something to keep them from floating aimlessly. With no land in sight, they had to rely on Jose's fishing skills to sustain themselves. Now using his bare hands, Jose caught fish and would beat them against the floor of the boat to kill them. And the men also trapped birds that rested on the boat and even caught sea turtles swimming by. As cooking anything was impossible, Ezequiel would expertly fillet the fish and other sea creatures and would dry the meat out on the side of the boat when possible, as they would eat their catch and not waste any part of the animal. 
they sheltered as best they could, and they would trade off spending time inside the icebox to save them from the harshest rays of the sun during the day, but the scorching sun still beat down on them when they weren't in there, burning their skin, while the relentless waves battered their bodies. Dehydration became their constant companion, but they were able to pull in small containers from some of the garbage floating around in the sea and caught rainwater in bottles, shoes, a barrel they fished out of the water, and plastic bags, and they drank rainwater along with turtle blood, and yes, even their own urine to quench their thirst and stave off dehydration as best they could, which was sapping their strength more and more every day. After two months at sea, Jose had adapted, in a way, to being able to eat birds and turtles. But Ezequiel was having a really hard time by this point. He hated especially eating the birds and ate as little as he could. As the months wore on, Ezequiel's body weakened and he faced exhaustion and malnutrition. On one occasion, about four months into this nightmare, Ezequiel was forcing himself to eat a bird raw, and when he cut it open, he saw that the bird had swallowed a snake. That was his breaking point. Falling into a deep sense of depression and despair, he lost all hope and refused to eat the raw food that was making him so sick. He had to have known that by doing this, he was effectively condemning himself to death by starvation. For the next few days, he would only drink water, sometimes drips at a time fed to him by Jose when he was too weak to do it himself. Soon after, Ezequiel lost his battle, lost consciousness, and died. Jose Alvarenga said that when young Ezequiel died, he had thoughts of killing himself as well. But he said that his Christian faith kept him from committing suicide and that it took everything he had to fight against the overwhelming despair he felt, and he clung to the tiniest hope left in him to survive alone. At first, he didn't have the heart to throw Ezequiel's body overboard. Before Ezequiel died, he made Jose promise that he wouldn't eat his body after he was gone. He knew that that was a possibility given the situation, and that Jose would find his mother and tell him their story firsthand. Jose said he couldn't resort to cannibalism, even if it meant him dying as well, but in his state of shock and grief, he continued to carry on conversations with Ezequiel's lifeless body for another six days. Finally, after he feared he was going insane, he said a prayer and pushed Ezequiel into the Pacific. Now, he was totally alone to face isolation and uncertainty. Jose said that he could see large container ships and other cargo ships in the ocean in the distance, but he had no way to signal them to get help. He was on a 23-foot piece of fiberglass in the water with no lights, no flare gun or sail or anything else to attract attention he was pretty much invisible out there for months and months. Jose had kept a sense of time during this whole ordeal by counting the phases of the moon, which no doubt was a result of his experience out there on the water. He was in what he figured was his 15th lunar cycle, and it would be mid-January of the year 2014. It was in this lunar cycle when he saw a faint light in the distance at night. And after sunrise, he started seeing more and more birds, land-based birds. Both of these signs meant one thing, some kind of land was nearby. And he was right. The current had finally taken him near terra firma. On January 30th, 2014, he cut the buoys from the boat to let it get closer. Then he dove off his boat and swam to a distant shore, powered by what little energy he had left in him and pure adrenaline. And he made it to shore. 
all he had with him was a knife. And once he made it to shore, he walked for what he thought seemed forever. But there were coconuts and some fruit there near on the beach. So he used his knife to cut them open and he was able to eat his fill of the first land-based real food in over a year. With a belly full of fruit, he rested and fell into what was the first real sleep he'd had in over a year. When his siesta was over, he had no idea how long he'd slept. He kept walking along the beach and soon saw something red flapping in the distance in the wind. That red flapping thing in the distance was a shirt on a clothesline. Then he saw a small house nearby. He walked as fast as he could and he started calling out to the house, hoping there might be someone inside. There was. Inside the house were Emily Bokmeto and her husband Russell Laikidrik, two locals from a nearby island who worked for a company harvesting coconuts on this little piece of land out in the middle of nowhere. They came out after hearing the noise outside and found themselves facing a half-naked caveman-looking guy with a mop of reddish-brown hair and a beard to match, speaking and shouting in the language they could not understand. Somehow they figured he'd been out in the sea and had had a terrible time of it, and what spoken language couldn't convey, body language, laughing, and tears did. They called for help from a nearby island, and Jose's odyssey was nearing its end. But it was natural that they didn't speak Spanish. Spanish wasn't spoken anywhere remotely near that little spit of an island called Tile Islet, because they were in a remote corner of what is known as the Ebon Atoll of the Marshall Islands. If you sail or fly or go in a straight line from Costa Azul, Chiapas, Mexico to Tile Islet, you would have traveled over 6,500 miles, 10,000 kilometers. To give you an idea, the distance from Key West, Florida to Seattle, Washington is about 2,700 miles. Now do the math to get well over 6,000 miles and get an idea of how long he drifted. Now experts say that had Jose missed this chain of islands, he would have drifted north of Australia, possibly running aground in Papua New Guinea, but more likely continuing another 3,000 miles towards the eastern coast of the Philippines. Jose Salvador Alvarenga's journey had lasted 438 days, well over a year. And for all that he'd been through, despite being fairly emaciated and dehydrated, Jose was in relatively good health. The Marshall Islands Secretary of Foreign Affairs, G. Bing, said that his vitals were good, with the exception of unusually low blood pressure and that Jose's ankles were very swollen, and he had trouble walking, which is to be expected after being out on the water for over a year. News of the castaway's miraculous survival spread like wildfire. The world stood in awe of this man who had defied all odds, surviving the treacherous Pacific Ocean for over a year. Jose Salvador Alvarenga became a symbol of resilience and endurance. His story captivated the media and captivated hearts around the world. But, along with the accolades and admiration, doubt and skepticism soon emerged. Some questioned the truth of Jose's account, pointing to the challenges of surviving for such an extended period at sea. But regardless of the controversies, one thing remained undeniable. Jose's journey and his indomitable spirit had left an indelible mark on our collective consciousness. But the implausibility of someone surviving so long at sea on such a small craft led a number of commentators to doubt Jose's story. But investigators were able to confirm some of the basic details. That's because shortly after he made it to the island, his boat was found as well. The owner of the boat he used, Cesar Castillo, corroborated the boat's registration number as being his. Castillo couldn't believe Jose had made it out alive at all and so very far away from home. He said it's incredible to survive that long. It's hard to think how anybody could go more than six or seven months without dying from scurvy. However, in an interview, 
Claude Piantadosi of Duke University said that fresh meat from birds and turtles contains vitamin C, and that eating a lot of it, as Alvarenga claims to have done, would provide sufficient vitamin C to prevent scurvy. The U.S. ambassador to the Marshall Islands, Tom Armbruster, acknowledged that it seems implausible for someone to survive at sea for 13 months, that it's also hard to imagine how someone might arrive out there in the middle of nowhere, out of the blue. Certainly, this guy has had an ordeal and has been at sea for some time. Norman Barth, also from the American Embassy in the Marshall Islands, did the initial questioning of Jose upon his arrival and found him to be truthful. As far as being taken so far just by currents, experts and oceanographers have come to the conclusion that it's entirely possible that sea currents could carry a boat from Mexico to the Marshall Islands. Eric Van Sebeel, an oceanographer at the University of New South Wales in Australia, figured that a trip like that would take about 18 months, and that 13 months definitely was plausible. More support for Jose's account came from a study by researchers at the University of Hawaii that modeled the path a boat might have taken after departing from the Pacific coast in Mexico based on winds and current conditions and concluded that it would have ended up within 120 miles of the place where Jose actually landed. In April 2014, Jose's lawyer told a press conference that he'd passed a polygraph test while being asked about his voyage. After 11 days in the hospital, Jose Salvador Alvarenga was deemed healthy enough to return to El Salvador. However, he had been diagnosed with anemia, had trouble sleeping, and naturally developed a fear of water. After recovering from his experience, at least physically, Jose kept his promise to Ezequiel and went back to his family's home in Mexico to talk to them in person. But Ezequiel's mother wouldn't stand to hear anything about her son's death. In 2015, Jose gave a series of interviews about his ordeal to the journalist Jonathan Franklin, who published the story as the book 438 Days, an extraordinary true story of survival at sea. The movie for that book, if it hasn't been made yet, should be on the horizon soon, as it's a hell of a story. Shortly after the release of the book, the family of Ezequiel Cordova sued Jose for $1 million dollars accusing him of cannibalizing Ezequiel in order to survive, breaching their pact that Córdoba would not be eaten after death. Jose's lawyer has denied this accusation. I don't know how they came to that conclusion, but money has an unusual way of leading us to conclusions we wouldn't have come to otherwise. The extraordinary story of Jose Salvador Alvarenga takes us on a journey filled with peril, resilience, and the triumph of the human spirit. He faced treacherous storms, hunger, isolation, and the heartbreaking loss of his companion Ezequiel. While controversies and skepticism might surround this story, the essence of this story reminds me of the indomitable will to survive against insurmountable odds. Jose's odyssey is a testament to the strength of our human spirit and the extraordinary feats that we can achieve when hope prevails even in the face of the most daunting challenges. If we reflect on the incredible story of Jose Salvador Alvarenga, let's take a moment to appreciate the resilience of our human spirit and draw inspiration from his remarkable journey. In the face of adversity, sometimes it's the faint and distant light of hope that guides us through the darkest of times and leads us to survival against all odds. I thank you for listening, following, and sharing this podcast on Spotify, iTunes, iHeartRadio, Overcast, YouTube, and everywhere else we're playing this. And I send everyone out there hot and humid summer greetings from Cancun, Quintana Roo, Mexico. I'm Andrew Colon. Adios. Thank you.